back on the ensuing kickoff. Take a 17-14 lead into the final minute. The Vikings' Clyde Reves tied the score with a 41-yard field goal, but they were guilty of holding, and the next try was no good. The Saints escaped with a three-point win over the Vikings. Now, since our last show, the Saints have played two games. The first one, a 42-7 loss to the 49ers on Monday Night Football. We won't talk much about that one. But on Sunday, the Saints rebounded with a win over the Vikings. The Saints have the second-best record in the NFC at 7-4. and four. Let's start things off tonight, as we always do, by bringing out the head coach of the Saints, Jim Mora. Hello, Jim. How are you? vocal group tonight, Jim. Yeah, they're excited. Spirited tonight, right. Jim, Ricky Jackson said in the locker room after the game, in an interview, he said he gave you the Gatorade dunk, which we will see later, because he felt after the Niners lost, you were very disappointed, you were holding your emotions inside, and after you beat the Vikings, he wanted you to cool off. Now, how did you feel after the Niners lost, and was Ricky right about your feelings? Well, I was disappointed after the Niners lost. Everybody was uh, within the organization. I wasn't the only one. Anytime you get beat, you're disappointed. And we got beat. And, uh, but that was the extent of it. It wasn't any more emotional than after any other loss you've had? No. All right, the team responded with a win over the Vikings. Uh, there were three turnovers though, Jim. Uh, Wade Wilson told me at camp last week, sometimes everything goes right, as in the first five games. Other times the opposite happens, some things just go wrong in a snowball. But he said as a veteran, he doesn't let bad things affect him, he keeps on playing. Now when he threw that first interception against the Vikings, what was in your mind? Did you feel that he would come out and keep on plugging? Sure, I, I have a lot of confidence in Wade. I have a lot of confidence in all of our players. I have a lot of confidence in our entire team. Uh, <clears throat> that's all you do in this business. If things go bad against you, you just keep playing. You don't, you don't quit. You don't throw on the towel. You don't get all upset. You right. just uh, keep plugging because good things and bad things happen to everybody and every team. And the good things happen in the Vikings game. We'll take a break now, but when we come back, a look at the Vikings game tapes, and we'll see how New Orleans native Tyrone Hughes turned the game around. The coach reveals the turning point, and hear the other side's opinion of our New Orleans Saints. Thanks. Welcome back. Despite winning two of their last six games, the Saints still are just one game out of first place in the NFC West, and they're tied, again, for the second-best record in the NFC with five games to go. Let's look now at the Vikings game, one that came down to the last seconds. We start... With the Saints' first drive, Jim, 75 yards it went and ended up scoring with Fred McAfee. All right, we had an excellent first drive, and this capped it off here. This is a, a fine play, a, a good running play. Freddie made a good read and bounced the play outside, and he had clear sailing into the end zone. It was 7-0. The Vikings then drove Sean Salisbury to Steve Jordan to tie it up. All right, they came right back on their first drive and threw the pass here to Jordan, and he just got it into the end zone, as you can see, but it counted, and... Uh, 7-7. Seven, seven. Now let's look at this, Jim. This is Wade Wilson's uh, second interception. It hits the umpire right there. What do you do about that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's part of the game. And it doesn't happen very often, but it happened in this case. And uh, I think it would have been com completed to Hobie, but uh, it wasn't. And then the turnover again here, Jim. A fumble by Derek Ned trying to get some yardage. Well, this was in the, uh, the third quarter, and we were throwing a screen to Derek. And other than the one guy there, he had a pretty good uh, shot to get some yardage, but he fumbled and... Uh, they got a touchdown right here. They, we had a blitz on, safety blitz, and gave them a little bit too much time, and, uh, and, and uh, the receiver got open. Right, it was 14-7 near the end of the third quarter. The momentum was with Minnesota at that point, Jim. Were you thinking at that point, 
like, here we go again, and things are going wrong against us again? No. I was thinking we were down by seven, and we had to score more than that to win. It takes only one big play to get it back, and uh, that's exactly what the Saints got from rookie Tyrone Hughes. The Vikings kicked off on the last play of the third quarter, and here it was, 99 yards. Well, it was a great, uh, great uh, effort on, on Tyrone's part individually, and we also had some very good blocking by our kick, kickoff return team, and it, it worked out, and uh, it was a great play, and got us, got us back up even, and you know, got the momentum back in our favor right away, which I think was a big thing. 14-14 into the fourth quarter. The Saints got it back, and they drove Fred McAfee, another nice run here, 27 yards. Well, yeah, in the fourth quarter, we, we got another drive going, and this was a, a big play in the drive, a run to Freddie, almost broke us the whole distance, but we ended up kicking a field goal, which gave us a 17-14 lead. There was about 10 minutes left, up by three. Saints defense got four sacks. Les Miller had a good game. He and Mills get him here. Well, here's a, a nice rush by both Les and Sam, and uh, I, th I thought our defense played well throughout the game, and, and they played extremely well in the fourth quarter when it was very important that they do that. For the last minute, yeah. Jim, here, Floyd Reves made a 41-yard field goal, but you saw it. It was holding. Fred Strickland holding Tyrone Leggett. They got a 10-yard penalty, and then Jim Wilkes got his hand on it, and the game was over, 17-14, and you got a little shower from Ricky Jackson here. <laughs> well, you know, Ricky's done that a couple times since I've been here, and uh, that's good. I, You know, it's, it means we're going to win. I like that, but uh, I don't mind it. Is Ricky one of the few players who can get, get away with that? Uh, no, any I knew these guys could. <laughs> they know that. <laughs> I think we can all figure out what the turning point was, turn the game around, uh, courtesy of a rookie from Nebraska by way of St. Augustine High School. All right, I don't think there was any question as to what the turning point of the game was. It was the, uh, the kickoff return by Tyrone, and we just saw it here a minute ago. Here it is from a little different angle. Uh, but uh, as I say, a great individual effort on Tyrone's part, and uh, about 10 other guys doing a good job, and uh, it got, got things going for us again. And on the Vikings side, they felt uh, they should have gone into overtime with a chance to win the game. But the holding call on the first field goal and Jim Wilkes play the second prevented that. Here's more of what the Vikings had to say from their locker room. Be sure it's deflating. Anytime you somebody takes a 99-yard one after, and then I think after the first touchdown, they took it back out to the 50. So, you know, you just, it's nobody's fault. I mean, that's, uh, that's the way it is. They're a good team, too. They get paid. And, um, and we're 14, 14, we got to come back out and do it. There's no way in this league that you can go out in, in November and December and expect uh, to go to the playoffs when you're giving up 99 yards kickoff return. Let's not point the finger at other people. Let's just everybody look in the mirror and make sure that you're doing all you can, that it's the most important thing going, and that uh, you're doing all you can to help this team win. And, and if you, you are, then you can look yourself in the mirror and you don't have anything to be ashamed of. Well, it's time for another break, but stay tuned for more, including our first fan question for Jim Mora. That's always interesting, and we'll do it right after this. When we return, we'll visit fans in the stands as the Jim Mora Show presents Hey Coach. to leave the studio now an out of studio experience if you will we are going to the grand casino in gulfport mississippi and see what's happening with ron sabota ron what's up at the grand it's only me coach um we enjoyed it though hey it was it was a cold day in minnesota would have gotten a lot colder had not the saints come out 17 14 winners and i saw some things that I enjoyed seeing. It was good to see Sam Mills back making tackles. It was good to see Hobie Brenner back, and he made a catch in that ball game. And it was good to see Herb Smith, the rookie tight end, getting some balls, getting open and catching them on his feet. And that might have had something to do with Hobie Brenner being back. It was also good to see the team run the ball exclusively, almost, in that first drive, capping it off Fred McAfee, who hasn't carried the ball that much but was up to the 21 carries in this football game it was also uh, good to see our homeboy tyrone hughes he had one for 48 yards that the saints didn't score on but this 99 yarder by in every way got the saints chestnuts out of the fire and back into a ball game but it it is still nettlesome uh, turnovers the thing that i think kept people in the ball game against the saints happened again and they seem to be just as creative as before maybe more so Derek Ned on that uh, 
screen that never developed. The ball gets kicked out of his hands, and that's kind of unusual. And then uh, you'll see it here develop. As this uh, screen kind of develops late, I think uh, Wade is... Uh, Oh, this is the pass to the official, and how many times are you going to drill an official? He's not looking at the football, and that thing's got the nose down, and it's sort of finding him, and naturally it goes straight up in the air for an interception. You can't blame that one on Wilson. I thought Wilson played a pretty good ball game. But, Coach, it's turnovers again that, that kept a team that I thought shouldn't have been close to you in a football game. Do you think this team needs to loosen up a little? Do you think the Gatorade shower for the head coach and the wind can, can help them uh, uh, get to a more relaxed situation out there and maybe stop the turnovers? Ron, uh, I don't think the, uh, I think our team is very relaxed. I don't, I don't think it's uptight at all. I think they, they're very relaxed during the course of the week. They work hard and they're intense, but they're, they're very relaxed. They, they go into the games relaxed, but with, you know, a, a sense of wanting to get the job done and playing hard and playing tough. Um, and uh, I, I don't think that really has anything to do with the turnovers. Okay. Okay, Coach, we'll be back later on with some questions from the audience at the Grand Casino. We'll see you later. Ron, we'll see you then. Every week our cameras roam the dome at St. Tone Games or they go around town on away games and give fans a chance to ask you more something. It's called, Hey Coach. And here's the first question we have tonight. Hey Coach, Gino Ray, I'm with Division 7. Uh, in the Green Bay and the Minnesota game, towards the end of the game, they drove the ball and they got in a position to kick a field goal. What can we do to prevent that next time? Well, in the, uh, in the Green Bay game, you know, we gave up that, that long pass, which uh, was just uh, an error on our part. and We just got to uh, not let those things happen. And then in the, uh, the same thing in the, in the game Sunday against Minnesota, we, uh, we gave up, a, a, I think it was a 37-yarder. Um, uh, and and we, we made a poor play on the ball, and uh, they, they got it. I mean, we just got to be a little bit smarter in, in how we handle things back there in those kind of situations. Here's our next question on Hey Coach. Hey, Coach Moore. My name is Janet Grant, and I work at Mother's Restaurant. I wanted to ask you, did, have you gained more confidence in Irv Smith since he played a good game yesterday? I've always had a lot of confidence in Irv. I think he's a, a real good young player. Uh, He's a rookie. Rookies make mistakes, uh, uh, and yet he's, he's got an outstanding future ahead of him, and, and he gets better every week. I think the fact that he got those four catches and made some good plays in the Minnesota game will help his confidence, uh, and I think that's going to be very important. And we've got one more question tonight. Hey, Coach. My name is Larry Shelby. I was looking at the game yesterday. It's a nice game. I, I seen Derrick Brown on the sideline without uniform. I wonder when it's when is he going to be able to play again? Well, we're hoping Derek will be able to play this week. He sprained his ankle against uh, San Francisco. He's kind of been bothered by a sprained ankle for a few weeks, and uh, he, he just wasn't able to play against the Vikings. But, uh, you know, he was jogging today in practice, uh, not in practice, but he was out there jogging today, and we're just going to have to take it a day to day and, and see how he looks Wednesday and then and Thursday and, and so on and make a decision by the time we play Cleveland. More questions are coming your way later, Jim, but now let's hear from one of the Saints' assistant coaches. It's Coach's Handbook with Brian Grenrude. This week, Brian met with running back coach Jim Skipper to talk running game. Running back coach Jim Skipper joins us this week on Coach's Handbook to explain hitting the hole. And Coach, explain to me what numbering system y'all use for the holes and how a running back knows which hole to hit. Well, you know, everybody uses a different system, but here with the Saints, what we do is the even numbers are to the right and the odd numbers are to the left. For example, here on the center, we say, okay, what we do here, this the one and zero is right on the center, okay? Then when we would go two would be right over the right guard, four would be over the tackle, six over the tight end, and eight is outside, okay? And vice versa, if we were going to go to the left here in the odd, okay, that would just change. Here you'd go one three, five, seven, and nine. Okay, and then what we also do to distinguish which one of the ball uh, backs is gonna be the ball carrier, well, we got a two back set that all the 20s will go to the full back and all the teens will go to the half back. For example, we're gonna run 18 ball. That says one, that tells the half back's gonna get the ball. The eight tells him he's gonna take it to the eight hole and boss tells us what type of action and what type of blocking we're gonna get. So if we go high right 18 balls, that means the halfback's going to get the ball. It's going to be a toss to him, and he's going to go to the outside. And the boss part means back on strong safety. So the fullback 
going to search out the strong safety. And then we throw the line all their blocking schemes, and the quarterback will turn around and toss the ball. Now, if we say we want to run to the, with the fullback on the, on the, as the ball carrier, we go I right P20 man. So now that would tell the fullback he's getting the ball because he's a two back. He's going to hit the zero hole, which is right on the right side of the center. So now he's got a run key, so it all depends on the defense. Now, if the center's covered, he's the run key. If the guard's covered and the center's uncovered, the read becomes over the guard. So now what comes into effect, sometimes you get the defense will stem. In other words, they'll line up here and move on the last second over to the guard. So what has to happen is the ball carrier and the line has to understand that at one time because the change just that quick on us and we got to react to it. Right, Coach. We appreciate it. We'll see you next week on Coach's Handbook. Thank you, Brian and Jim. Uh, Jim, you talked a little bit about it. When you call a play and pick a hole, sometimes it doesn't work. Did Fred McAfee ad-lib on that touchdown? Yeah, on the, on the touchdown, he, uh, the, 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 although we, we were prepared for that possibility happening, and he was, he, was, he, he was anticipating the fact that he may have to bounce it outside yeah. depending upon how the defense reacted to the, to the play and the blocking scheme, and that's what he did, and it was, you know, like I said, it was an easy score for us. All right. When we come back, we'll be visited by one of the very large parts of the Saints linebacking corps, one of the hardest hitters in the game. Vaughn Johnson is here, and we'll talk with him right after this. Coming up next on the Jim Mora Show, we'll profile Saints wide receiver Floyd Turner, a man on the comeback trail. He's next. Our player tonight is on I'm sorry, okay, okay. our player guest tonight is on his way to another all pro year he led the team with 13 tackles sunday against minnesota and he knocked down a pass i think you know who i'm talking about here number 53 vaughn johnson The win over the Vikings, uh, was this one you almost had to have at this point in the season as the playoffs get closer and closer? Well, we feel as if every game is an important game. You know, the closer we get to the end of the season, they become bigger and a lot more important. We knew going into this game that it was a game that we had to have. Now, defensively, the Saints got good pressure on Sean Salisbury. Four sacks on him. Uh, Les Miller, Sam Mills got in there. Uh, how much will getting these guys back, some of the injured players like Miller, Wilkes, and Mills, help down the stretch? Oh, it's going to be a big help for us. You know, the more guys you can get back from injury, the better off your team is going to be, especially your veteran players, the guys right. that's been around and been through it and know what it takes to win ball games. It's great to get those guys back. Now, we heard Jim answer this question earlier, and it was a very good answer. But uh, the Packers and Vikings have been able to mount drives in the last minute. Let me ask you the same thing. What's the problem there? What can you do to stop those guys driving in the last minute? Well, I think basically, defensively, we have to play better. Uh, as the game goes on and it gets close to the end of the game, we've got to figure out a way to make a play, you know. Those guys did a good job on uh, making a couple of drives on us, but uh, we just have to have a guy to step up and make a play. Well, on 7-4 and four right now with five games left, looking ahead, what is your feeling about this team? Well, one thing about it, we won't be looking ahead. We're going to take them one at a time. We feel good about this team and the guys here in the organization. We feel as if uh, if we go ahead and take care of our business and worry about these things and not anybody else, just continue to work hard and do the things we've done, we'll be okay. Let's look a little bit ahead to the Cleveland game. I know that's what you're looking at. The Browns are struggling a bit. They're five and six. They've lost their last four. They got rid of quarterback Bernie Kosar earlier in the year. They've got Todd Philcox in there right now, relatively untested. Now, do you like to see that, a guy who's kind of inexperienced back there? Well, I think it's always good when you get a quarterback that uh, hasn't really been tested, especially with the guys who have up front and the way we get after the quarterback. Uh, it'll be a good test for him and us. Uh, yeah, they don't know if Vinny Testaverde is going to play yet, but you faced him too as well. Yeah, he's a big, strong quarterback. He does a good job throwing the deep ball. And uh, like I said, he's a strong quarterback. You know, once you get to him, you really got to do a good job getting him down. All right, Vaughn, we will talk to you a little bit later. Come back for more questions for being our player guest tonight. You'll receive a gift certificate from Oakland Heart Jewelers on Metairie Road. Saints receiver Floyd Turner had a great year in 1991, but last year he suffered a badly broken leg. And now, more than a year later, He's still trying to get back to form. Jim Gallagher has that story in this week's Sideliner. Monday night's loss in San Francisco is a game most players want to forget. All except for wide receiver Floyd Turner, who had his best day of 1993. 
But to understand how important his five catches were, you have to realize how far Floyd has come back. On September 13th of last year, Turner fractured his femur, returning a punt against the Chicago Bears. Do you ever look back at that tape of that injury? Uh, I've seen it several times. I mean, to me, it was just uh, a hit. I, I can't see any different hit than I've, that I've taken from the others. A lot of people told me, you know, that it was a hard hit, it was a loud hit. I think I just got caught in a bad situation and an injury happened. The hard part was coming back. Months of rehab got his body in shape, but it's taken a while to work his way back into the lineup. For you, too, was it a case that you needed to get that confidence, too? Because it's human nature to be a little hesitant, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I need to get in. I need to uh, actually get hit. I need to catch the ball in the crowd. Uh, I needed all of that, and um, it wasn't going to happen standing on the sidelines. And once, it's, uh, once they put me in, and, and now I'm getting the feel of it, it's getting more comfortable. The injury was especially tough because Floyd was coming off his finest season as a pro in 1991. His 64 catches and eight touchdowns were both career highs. Floyd was actually inactive for five games early this season, but he started two recently, and he finally feels he's all the way back. Boy, it seems to me like you're just you're starting to get more relaxed. You're starting to get more comfortable out there. Uh, yeah. The more time I get, uh, the more routes I run, the more balls I throw to him, I get more and more comfortable each, each time. It's really hard standing there and not being a, a major country, having a major country to do it. I mean, after a couple of years ago, you come in expected high expectancies, and then uh, this happened, which you know, I mean, you know the sport, you know the game, and it can happen at any time, but it's still hard to handle. But so far, Floyd's been handling it well. For the Jim Mora Show, I'm Jim Gallagher. Jim, does Floyd look 100% to you right there on the field? Yeah, I think Floyd's back 100%. Uh, I think a lot of it was mental, as it often is when right. you get a, a real tough injury like that. And I think I think Floyd's back now and, you know, and doing good. He did well against the 49ers the other night. Well, he's played well the last couple of weeks. He didn't catch any balls against Minnesota, but uh, he's, he's playing well, and, and I think it's just a matter of time before he really starts getting some balls and you know, helping us uh, really have a big impact on the, on the outcome of the game. Good news there. Break time once again now, but the studio audience gets into the act next in the Michael A. Bear armchair quarterback segment. So stay tuned for that right after this. When we come back, Ron and Guest talk to the coach from the Grand Casino in Gulfport. Well, we are back, and back we are going to Gulfport, Mississippi. The beautiful Grand Casino has become a gathering place for Gulf Coast Saints fans on Monday night. And with them is Ron Svoboda. Ron, are there any okay, questions right for Jim Mora amongst the crowds there? We are back at the Grand Casino, and our guests here are abuzz with questions. Your name and your question. Kevin Berto from uh, Laplace, Louisiana. Coach, I'd like to know if you have a sequence of uh, plays you call in a hurry-up offense uh, the last closing minutes of the game. Uh, yes, we do have uh, you know plays that uh, we feel are uh, best for that kind of opportunity. It, it kind of depends upon the team that we're playing and what we feel can be successful against them. But uh, um, yeah, it's, it's limited to a certain group of plays. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Your your name and your question. Hi, uh, Barbara Martinez from Slidell, Louisiana. Coach Moore, what do you think it was that triggered all of the pressure on the Vikings quarterback in the second half? Well, we, we, we used some uh, rushes that, uh, that we hadn't used before, but I think it was just a question of our guys just doing a better job of, of getting to the quarterback, realizing how important it was for uh, us to put pressure on the quarterback that second half, being the tight game that it was. Coach, in connection with that, uh, even with all that pressure in the second half, and I'm talking about the last drive uh, towards the potential tying touchdown, that a tying a field goal that never happened, uh, the secondary let a couple of guys get loose. Uh, uh, would you comment on, on how you feel the secondary's been playing in the last few games, tackling and covering? Well, I, th I didn't think our defense tackled very well against San Francisco, our whole defense as a, as a whole. I felt like we tackled uh, pretty darn well Sunday. Um, I thought like our secondary played pretty good Sunday. We, we gave out a couple of game balls uh, today and, and uh, we gave two to, uh, one to Keith Taylor and one to Vince Buck. Uh, I think you know, that indicated they, they played pretty well. That last, uh, that one, that last 37 yard completion was, was not a good play. Uh, 
and, and, and we're just going to have to do a, a better job of, of, of getting that handled. Would it have would have been better to, to, to play the man there as opposed to trying for the ball, or is that just a second guess? Well, he could, he could have played the ball, like, but he could have played it with better than he did. You know, he could have been uh, using better technique than he did in, in, in making that play. That's right. Okay, Coach, we'll be back to talk a little bit about the Browns and ask some questions there when we get back to the Grand Casino. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ron. Well, that's nice, but the really, really diehard Saints fans are here in the studio. They've written in for tickets. They've also submitted questions they'd like to ask, and we'll do that now. The Michael A. Bear armchair quarterback segment. Let's get it going and get the first question. Hi, Coach. Uh, Terry Crappenzano from Hammond. Uh, Coach, uh, other than uh, eliminating these costly turnovers that we're uh, creating on offense and perhaps uh, creating more turnovers on defense, uh, what's it going to take to get the team to start playing at the level that they were playing at at the beginning of the season? Well, I think what you mentioned are, are, are probably the biggest thing. Now, there's always things you can improve on, and the, the, ter the takeaway giveaway factor certainly isn't the only thing that, that we need to work on, and, and not unlike any other team, but... I think if, if you had to put your finger on one area of our team that's been different in the first five games, I think that would be it. Jerry, Jerry Boyer from Nettery. Boy, I'd like to know what school you attend and how is it you weren't drafted out of, out, out of college and how'd you ever end up in the USFL? Well, I, <laughs> I attended uh, North Carolina State University and I elected to go to the USFL. I had an opportunity to wait around for the draft, but uh, I knew where I would be in the USFL. I would be in Jacksonville, Florida, and I knew that was a nice place to go, and uh, I think it was the best opportunity for me. Yeah, Coach, would you can, uh, Mark from New Orleans, would you consider Tyrone Hughes a receiver? Mark, we have uh, discussed this as a staff. We talked about this before we drafted Tyrone because he did play some receiver at Nebraska, as you know. And we, we, we also talked about it after we drafted him, and, and uh, we worked him out before we drafted him, both at receiver and defensive back. We see him every day in practice because he plays both defensive back, and then when, when our defense is out there working against the opponent, Tyrone takes some snaps as a receiver. And just based upon our evaluation of Tyrone, we think that he's got a much brighter future in the NFL as a defensive back than he does a receiver. I'm from Swella. Ray Shoots of Farrah from Harahan, Louisiana. In yesterday's game, the quarterback, Wade Wilson, while attempting to pass, hit the uh, referee. Why isn't that a dead ball? Well, that's, it just isn't, <laughs> you know, and, and yet, I, I, in fact, today at, uh, at work, some of the coaches, we were discussing the fact that that might be a good rule change, that if, uh, if a, an attempted pass ever does hit an official, that it's an automatic, it's an automatic dead ball, but uh, if it's, you know, it's never even come up in discussions at the league meetings that I've attended or in, or in officiating sessions that I've been involved in. It's never been discussed. I'm, I'm sure it has been discussed by some people, but it, it might not be a bad idea. <laughs> I know. <laughs> all right, thank you very much for the questions tonight. Uh, that's all the time we've got. Now we make Christmas come a little early for someone. Ron Johnson will dig in this bowl right here. He'll pull out a name and read the question, and we'll give away a new bench craft recliner from Michael A. Bear's furniture. What do we have, Ron? Okay. Yvonne. What's that? Uh, Delise? Delise. Yvonne Delise. She's right there in the uh, front row. All right, Yvonne. <laughs> Do you have a question, Ron? And her question is, how is Lorenzo Neal? Lorenzo is, as you know, Yvonne is out for the season, but he's he's doing good. He's walking now on his own. He's rehabbing his ankle, and uh, I would say that I mean, he'll be fine for next year, but he'll even be ready to go a lot before that. I mean, he's he's close to being being well. I'd say another couple of months, and he'll be 100% ready to go. All right, Yvonne, thank you so much for that question. Congratulations on the new Benchcraft recliner. <laughs> Michael A. Bear's furniture will provide it. Jim, let me ask you a quick question. Will Lorenzo be able to come back to the playoffs, or is he done? No. Once you put a player on injury oh, reserve, true. he's that's out correct. for the entire season. Right, he cannot come back. Right. That's the rule. All right, thank you very much. 
Another timeout is needed, so we'll break again, but we'll hear from rock star Huey Lewis and the ever-popular Chris Berman when we come back. Don't miss it. Coming up next on The Jim Mora Show, we'll hear from Browns head coach Bill Belichick and see what he thinks about this week's game with the Browns. That's next. Every week here on the show, we interview celebrities, TV stars, network announcers, and we pick their brains about what they think of the Saints. This week, we hear from a very excitable sportscaster and a very popular rock star. Huey Lewis has sold millions of records, but he's also a huge sports fan. In fact, one of his biggest albums ever was entitled Sports. What is the thing that draws you to sports, baseball, and football? Um, good seats. <laughs> no, uh, you know, uh, no, we're, 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 we're similar. You know, we, uh, we play a lot of coliseums, take a lot of showers together. Uh-huh. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> and, uh, and we've gotten to know a few of the, a lot of the players really now. So, uh, you know, that really kind of, you get to be fans of certain players. Nowadays with free agency and everything, it's a little tougher to follow a team because you're friends go everywhere you know so i'm really a fan of the game itself sports has long been a part of Huey's life especially football he says that football and music actually have a lot in common there are a lot of similarities you know uh, you have to relax to play well i think you got to relax in big games to perform well you can't be although you're up for it you can't be too high strong you've got to wait and look for your moments you know and and the same thing's true with uh, performing the big, the big concerts you have to be you have to know what you're about and take it easy, you know. We also ran into the Swami, ESPN's Chris Berman. And Chris is a big fan of the job Jim Moore has done since coming to the Saints back in 1986. People forget. I hope they don't forget what the Saints were once and what they are now with Jim. They're a perennial playoff team. They are a perennial organized team. You know exactly what you get with the Saints. Uh, he, he's become a friend of mine. Uh, sure, he gets criticized because the Saints aren't a big play team, but they don't have the big play players that other teams have. I like to, the Saints have become a class team in this league. wasn't so long ago that the class, they were more crass than class, right? The New Orleans Saints at the Minnesota Vikings. Berman covers the NFL on a weekly basis for ESPN. He deals with coaches all over the league. And Chris says you have to work a little harder with Jim Mora. I don't expect that everyone should lay it out and, and say, well, every question you ask, you get every deep secret of the New Orleans Saints or their game plan or whatever. No, Jim is Jim's very fair. So I can ask is for somebody to be fair. Any uh, message you want to throw Jim Moore's way when I get the chance? Uh, smile. This is the year that playoff goose egg changes. This is the year. Jim, your friend Chris Berman, the, uh, the Swami, says this is the year. Hopefully his predictions will ring true. We'll find out. Is he a good friend of yours? Well, I, when you say good friend, I well, mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I've gotten to, I mean, he's a friend. Right. I, we don't, yeah, but I just know him through uh, uh, dealing with him with ESPN. Although last March at the league meetings in uh, Palm Springs, uh, my, Connie and I went out to dinner with he and his wife and Tom Flores and his wife and Don James and his wife. So we got to spend two or three hours together in a social way. And that's the first time we've done that. Yeah, he's been on the show before. And uh, hopefully, as we said, his uh, comments are true. Let's take this time now to announce our Saints Away tailgate party. The lucky winners in this contest get to watch the Saints-Browns game in a fully catered suite in the Superdome. Food, drinks, it's all there. It's part of our contest sponsored by WVUE Sports, your local Dodge dealers, and Saints Digest. The following winners get the sweet treatment this week, and they are Cheryl Payton of Metairie, Tanji Londo of Harvey, Brenda Goldman of Laplace, and Kim Pope of Kenner. Now, how do you win in this contest, you ask? Well, all you have to do is go to any Dodge dealer in the New Orleans area and drop your name in to register. It's that simple. We'll also pull a grand prize winner at the end of the year, and that prize is a brand new Dodge Ram truck. The next game for the Saints, the Cleveland Browns. After a 5-2 and two start, the Browns have fallen on hard times. They've lost their last four games in a row. Here's what happened in Sunday's Browns-Falcons game and some thoughts from Cleveland coach Bill Belichick.
Bobby Hebert threw two touchdown passes to lead Atlanta to a 17-0 lead over the Browns. But Todd Philcox brought Cleveland back. He threw this touchdown to Mark Carrier, and then he ran one in to make the score 17-14. But that's the way it ended. The Browns lose their fourth straight. Head coach Bill Belichick doesn't want to talk about the upcoming game until Wednesday. But he did say his team has been doing some things well. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm happy we lost four games, but you know, I thought we did some things pretty well in the game yesterday. You know, there's some things that we didn't do well enough. Obviously, that's what we lost. You know, I think you got to recognize that you know, they're, they're good teams we're playing against, too. You know, we just got to make a couple more plays. And then you see other teams that have slumped, and like Houston is a good example of a team that's come out of it. Belichick says he'll watch injured quarterback Vinny Testaverde this week in practice, but won't know if his separated shoulder will allow him to play. Like with any injured player, Steve, I can only go by what I see. So once we uh, once we see him out there and see what he can do, then you know, make some type of determination until he's out there, until he does anything. Uh, you know, I don't, there's nothing to evaluate. Jim, uh, the Browns are having problems, as you can see. Can you put a finger on what happened to the team that started out 5-2? and two? Is it mostly quarterback trouble, do you think? Well, I haven't, at this point, looked at a lot of Cleveland film. I, I don't think it's totally uh, quarterback trouble. I, I still think they're a very good football team. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of good teams that are the same record they got or right. close to it, 5-6. and six. And there's such a close margin of difference between uh, – team that's won seven or eight games and a team that's won four or five games in this business that it's been incredible you know to play here or play there so uh, you know we were five and oh and we're one and four or two and four the last six games they were five and two and they've lost four in a row and we think we're still a good football team and I'm sure they do too so uh, we're going to have our hands full Sunday and we're going to have to play well to beat those guys up there we'll talk more about the Browns later in reference to our Harburnia junior captain of the week though there is none since the team is on the road, but uh, we'll have one when the Saints come back home to play the Rams December 12th. We'll take our last break now, but there's still more to come. Back to the casino and a look ahead to Monday Night Football, so stick around for that. When we return, final comments from the Grand Casino and Golf Course and a preview of tonight's Monday Night Football matchup. It is time to take our last trip to the Grand Casino and join Ron Sabota for some final thoughts for the coach from Gulfport. Ron? Okay. Well, we'll probably need our warm clothes again next week against the Cleveland Browns. They play outdoors, and we have a question here. Your name and your question. My name is Carolyn Munson. I'm from Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, coach, I was just wondering, do you have any special plans to stop Eric, Mes Eric Metcalf on special teams next week? Well, not at this time, but uh, hopefully by uh, Sunday afternoon, we'll have some special plans. He's uh, an outstanding uh, punt returner, and uh, we're going we're gonna to have our work cut out for us. But our, our, our coverage teams I, I have been doing a good job, and I know they'll do a good job Sunday. Well, he might be the most potent thing they have on offense. Can you make a younger quarterback in terms of NFL experience like Todd Wilcox, can you make him a problem uh, to that offense uh, by creating things he hasn't seen before uh, because of his lack of experience? Oh, I don't know, Ron. I, 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 you know, sometimes guys with a lot of experience aren't very good, and sometimes guys with a lot with not very much experience are real talented. And and so you know, uh, he's a he's a talented young guy, and I, and he's playing been playing better each week. He he had a real good game against Atlanta, and uh, you know I think he's uh, making good progress and. Uh, like I say, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to try to do some things like we do every week to, to confuse those guys. Okay, Coach. Thanks a lot. That's it from the Grand Casino. Right. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. All right. We'll see you well, I don't think it does it matter uh, to the teams what, what the records are on Monday Night Football or any game for that matter. Uh, it always seems to be exciting on Monday night. Well, I think, I think when your guys know they're going to play on Monday night, you know the whole nation's watching, all their peers. Uh, and I, and I, th I think there's a little bit more excitement involved. Uh, and, and, and I, these are two pretty good football teams. Like I said earlier, even though their records aren't outstanding, they, you know, San Diego division champion last year, Indianapolis had a 9-7 and seven record last year. These guys are, are still good football teams. They just had some problems here recently, but uh, I expect it to be a great game tonight. Quick pick for us, sir? I think I'm going to go with San Diego. Even though it's at Indianapolis, I, I still think San Diego's a little bit better football team than Indianapolis. 
All right, Vaughn, let's talk about the Browns. Cleveland in December, not the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that. Cold, windy, maybe some snow. Uh, does that affect the player? I know players say once you get on the field that you forget about the weather, but you have to feel that cold. Well, it doesn't really bother me because uh, it's something we have no control of. You know, right. We know we've got to go and we have to play and we've got to win the ball game. So as far as Bob worrying yourself about the weather, why do it? Because you have no control of it. But, you know, it'll be a cold game. You know, maybe we'll get a little snow. It'll be fine with me. You like that kind of game? I'll take it. All right. <laughs> Vaughn, good luck against the Cleveland Browns. Jim, we'll see you back here next week. We're done for another week. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for coming down, audience. And we'll be back again next Monday night, 7 o'clock, with the story from the Browns game. Monday Night Football is next. We'll see you later. Good night, everybody. The Jim Morris Show has been a presentation of WVUE Sports. Our special thanks to River.